Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Claire Hansen. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Brant Hugetz. We're both on the Corporate Ventures team here at AAL. Um, today's session is really a time for you to ask us questions, but before we get to that, we want to set the scene and tell you a little bit about us. So like I mentioned, uh, Brant and I are on the Corporate Ventures team. We're the team responsible for lowering the barriers of entry for startups and commercial companies to come work with the Army. So within the Army, our team is really unique. We each come from industry. We're just a small team. You can see the four of us here. Um, but we each have a background working with early stage companies in some capacity. Um, my background is working primarily with investors of pre-seed through Series A companies. So, of course, uh, when working with the investors, I worked a lot with the companies that they were evaluating or investing in. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, Brands most recently worked in corporate innovation programs where he helped match startups to Fortune 500 companies and their innovation initiatives. We have two other teammates from industry as well who are on our team and who are also on this call. Um, Art is our entrepreneur in residence, so he's an entrepreneur himself. And no venture team would be complete without a trusty MBA. So we're very lucky to have Chad on our team as well. In terms of structure of this event, we'll take the first 15 minutes or so, maybe a little bit more, to tell you about the Army Applications Laboratory, um, affectionately known as AAL, uh, why AAL is here, and how companies like you can engage with us and, and work with the Army. Um, one quick note, this is our first ever AMA, so if there's anything you think would be helpful for us to include in future presentations, please just make a note of it, and if it's not an appropriate question to ask during the Q&A, uh, we'll send out a, a feedback survey after the event. So we want to get your feedback on, on the actual presentation we give here and make sure it's, um, you know, valuable valuable piece of this present uh, piece of this session. So yeah, do give us your feedback. Um, and after we wrap up our brief presentation, we'll spend the rest of the hour answering your questions. So thank you to those of you who already submitted some questions or topic areas through the Eventbrite registration, and please continue to submit those through the Q&A function. I know we're all super familiar with uh, video conferencing these days, but there is a Q&A function on the right hand uh, panel of your screen. So just make sure you're submitting questions there. Um, Chad and Art are also on the line, so they're going to be coming through those questions and helping us uh, create really good discussion when it comes time for Q&A. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Brands and let him kick us off with a brief introduction to AAL. Thanks, Claire. Appreciate that. So I want to click through one more slide. Um, we're going to show you a, a very mission statement. Uh, mission statement. Um, this, is, this is AAL's uh, goal. And the, I'll, I'll let you read it here, but the key takeaway here is that um, AEL is looking to engage with the commercial ecosystem uh, to leverage their technologies to solve Army problems. So the, the, the fun example I give here is if uh, the Army needs new flashlights, you know, instead of going out and paying someone to, to design and build a new flashlight, we can probably find a really great uh, tool from industry, paint it green, slap an Army logo on it, and save a bunch of money, save a bunch of time. Uh, you know, we, we haven't worked on flashlights yet, but, but that, that's the, the premise here. Um, so uh, one piece that I want to highlight here is that, um, you know, we, we're set up with a team of, of industry folks who work with startups, but we don't operate like a, like a VC would. Um, we have a, a pretty formalized process in how we engage with companies. So um, we, we start with a problem from an Army stakeholder, um, we line up all the key decision makers and influencers that need to be aligned on the Army side, and we package that all up before we even go talk with industry, right? So um, contrary to or, or um, in opposition to like a VC might operate where we're just looking for great ideas, we really have this structured approach that we take when we, when we try to um, modernize the Army here. Uh, and talk a little bit about our focus areas. So here are going to be a couple acronyms for folks who are brand new to the DoD. Here's your two acronyms for the day. Um, AAL, we sit underneath Army Futures Command. Um, that's AFC as uh, colloquially. And AFC's goal is to broad spectrum is to modernize the Army. So we're a small piece of that um, where we focus on commercial, commercial technologies. Um, and, and we serve AFC's cross-functional teams. So these are groups of people from across the Army, kind of horizontally so, that are brought together 
um, to collaborate on modernizing specific areas that the Army deems uh, important. So you see the list of, of eight down there. Um, we won't go into uh, you know, a ton of detail here, but just want you to know that these are uh, important groups within, within the Army organization, uh, and, and those are our clients. Those are who we're helping modernize um, their, their tools and, and tech stack. Um, an interesting part here, if you have a tech, uh, you know, a tech solution that you think the Army needs, but you don't know where to start, try reach, like researching and reading up on the cross-functional teams. These are going to be your, your best uh, points to understand what, what the Army is trying to do and what the needs are, right? So do a little homework there. If you don't know where your product fits, start with these CFTs. Um, and another key part that I'll, I'll mention here um, before you jump into these barriers of entry is um, while the Army is a large organization and every large organization can do a lot of innovation internally, AEL is primarily focused on soldiers. So uh, we do get a lot of questions about, hey, we've got this great HR software, or great, uh, you know, uh, back-end office tech that can, can, that can help. Um, well, I'm not going to say the Army doesn't need that stuff. That's not our, our focus. So just want to set that set expectations here. Um, and, and I want to talk a little bit about AL's process. Um, so when we were stood up about two years ago, part of our mission was to lower the barriers to entry, right? So we want to figure out, it's no, you know, it's no surprise that uh, the DOD is hard to do business with, especially for small businesses. And so we wanted to look at why that was. And what we found was a lot of kind of no-duh things, right? Uh, not, a, not a surprise for folks from industry. Um, but really the feedback that we got when we talked to investors and, and startups, it really boiled down to three broad groups, um, access, transparency, and capital. So I'll talk about that a little bit, again, just to kind of set the stage for, for how AAL operates. So the, the first piece, access, really this is, this is the, because there isn't a 1-800 number for the Army, right? If you're a startup, you, you don't know who to call, who to talk to, um, and, and once you get inside, you don't really know where to go. So AAL operates in a, in a way that when we work with a startup or a, a small business, we want to make sure that we're giving you access to the, the leaders, the decision makers, and most importantly, to the end users, the soldiers, so that as you're building a solution, you're iterating on it with the people who are using it. You're building the solution that the Army needs. Um, the other kind of key part here, which I'll touch on uh, a little bit here and, and more later, um, before we work on a project, we've got the, the uh, funding and the transition partner lined up. So again, this is kind of providing a streamlined access to all the key ingredients that you need as a, as a business owner to, uh, to do business with the Army. So the second piece that we'll talk about here is transparency. Um, I joke that half of my day is, is spent as a translator, translating Army speak to, to industry speak. And you know, we, we joke about that, but if you look at uh, RFPs or, or solicitations from the, from the government, they're really dense and they're hard to understand. Um, and it's not a, you know, it's not a matter of being smart or dumb. It's just, it's army speak. And for folks who don't know that it can be really challenging. Um, and it can really kind of close the door before, before an opportunity has even been open. So the CV team at AL, we really focus on uh, coming to, coming to solvers where you guys live, right? We, we want to talk with you on LinkedIn, on social media, through email. Um, we want to speak in a language that, that you understand. Um, and, and that's a key part of, of what we do. Um, the last piece I'll, I'll mention with transparency is that typically the Army buys tech with a, you know, a requirements list, right? I need this, this tool and needs these hundred properties. We're looking at it from, the different, uh, from a different angle. We're kind of flipping this on its head. We want to work on problems, right? And we want to trust that solution providers like you know or can help us find the best solution, right? We don't want to come in with something and, and have you just build it from a blueprint. We are looking to you to, to build that. Um, so really that transparency into our problems, and that's new for the Army, and it's a little vulnerable for us, but I think it's a really important step for building a culture of innovation. Uh, and the last piece we'll talk about here is, is capital. And, you know, this is kind of funny. There, there's a, a term valley of death, which describes the, the gap of projects you know, failing to transition from R&D stage to, you know, products being purchased by the Army. And if there's a term for it, you know it's a serious issue, I, I think, right? And, and we recognize that. I'm not going to say that we're going to solve all of this, but we recognize that it's an issue and we're doing our best to, to, to tackle this. Um, two kind of key parts here. We're providing 
more capital that's non-dilutive and so enticing to small businesses. Um, and we're providing it faster. Those are two things that we can do it, that we have in our control that add value to you as a, as a business owner. Um, as an example here, for our last cohort process that we ran, it was a, a cohort called Fire Faster. Um, once applications closed, within seven days, we had reviewed all of those applications and let the, the winners know within seven days. So that's like unheard of, you know, not just in the army, but you know, in the, in the broader corporate innovation space. So that, that's really, I think, a, um, a testimony to, to what we're trying to accomplish here. And then second, secondary to that, um, after that, after we let those companies know, within 30 days, we had 15 companies put on contract. So that's, again, unheard of in the Army. Uh, and we're really proud of, of that fact. And, you know, we set the bar high, so hopefully we can keep that up for, for our future projects. Uh, we, we definitely intend to. So from there, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Claire. Yeah. Thanks, Brands. Um, I just want to add one layer of additional context before we get into actually talking about the opportunities we have available now. And that's talking about kind of like why AAL exists or why the Army and DOD are even making modernization and commercial partnerships such a big priority now. So I'll keep it quick. Um, many of you are probably familiar with these sorts of headlines from the news. But the bottom line is that the U.S. military has become increasingly concerned that adversaries like China and Russia are outpacing us in our technology research and development. Basically, we're afraid that they're leveraging commercial technologies better than we are. And there's a lot of arguments to show that they probably are doing that. So we, we need to catch up to, to their modern processes. Um, if you look at the amount of commercial technology development in the U.S., it is really massive. Um, but it's still, uh, we haven't found ways to quite entice those are in that research and development to come to the DOD. A recent statistic shows that the DOD invested $11 billion into R&D, while over that same time period, Amazon alone spent $22 billion. So Amazon alone is spending twice as much on R&D. Um, of course, we're not here to specifically work with Amazon. We want to work with commercial companies of all sizes and especially startups. Um, but that's just a testament to show how the Army is really missing out on the opportunity to work with commercial companies that are, are working on the cutting edge of technologies. And so uh, just to kind of drive the point home, AAL is really a piece in solving that broader problem, right? So bringing it full cir circle, AAL is just a small team working to help improve improve our relationship our the dod's relationship with commercial so we see ourselves as the crucial connectors between the industry and the army um, and finding ways to create sort of win-wins between the dod and commercial companies like y'all so um yes we do a lot of connecting and engaging with startups and trying to tell you, hey, I promise it's not so scary to work with the DOD. We at the Army have got a good process for y'all. Um, but we're also uh, influencing the other direction, and that's internally into the Army. Uh, we are here helping bring them up to speed on commercial best practices and concepts like design thinking, which, believe it or not, is a brand new paradigm in the Army. So you'll see that a lot of our programs really rely on iterative development, which, again, is a brand new way of thinking about development for the Army. So we're here to plant those seeds and um, spread that kind of thinking throughout the whole organization over time, of course. It will take some time. All right, so pro this is the good stuff. This is probably what y'all want to hear hear most. So uh, we're just going to talk about a couple ways for uh, folks to engage with with AAL. Um, first thing, give yourself a pat on the back. You, you've done step one. Come to sessions like this. Um, AAL again, kind of grounding ourselves in, in best practices from from industry and the in, and from the innovation ecosystem. We want to be doing more sessions like this, webinars to to talk to you about AAL, um, to talk to you about the problems that we're doing. Uh, almost all of the, the Spartan programs that, uh, that we've done in, in the recent past and that we have coming up will we'll include webinars like this so you can uh, break down the barriers of, you know, talking with, with folks uh, who are building the problems and, and really get that context. Uh, the second way is through a broad agency announcement. And, and this is for kind of blue sky uh, ideas, right? Hey, I have this product. I think the Army can use it. I don't really know who or where. Um, this is really for us to just kind of see what's out there and if there's a good opportunity with an army customer we're going to do our best to to match make you with uh with an army client um i will say that's you know that's a little bit like uh 
find a needle in a haystack, you know, you're matching the technology on one side and, and the, the customer on the other side. Um, but it is an opportunity. You can find the, the application to, to go through that process on our website. I, I will note that this VA is unfunded currently, although we expect that we'll have some funding to devote to this in the future. Um, once we have funding, it might be a little bit easier for us to start doing proofs of concepts and, and prove out some technologies. Uh, and the last way, and I think this is the most relevant, are uh, active project solicitations. So this is the process that Claire and I mentioned that, uh, at the beginning. You know, we start with the Army, uh, the Army stakeholder who has the problem. We, we bring the fund and we start with the funding and we package that all up. And then we come to industry and say, hey, here's a problem that we have and we want you to show us how we can solve that. Um, this is really exciting. I, we're doing some really interesting um, processes and, uh, you know, to innovate this, uh, how, how the Army goes about solving projects here. Um, and, you know, I think we've got a couple projects live that we're going to talk about later on. So um, that's really exciting. Uh, definitely check out the, the al.army slash Spartan webpage to see what we've got going on there. Um, and then here's a here's a quick example. You know, if folks have questions about past projects, we're happy to answer those. But just a little taste of the, the style of how AL works. Um, this is a program called Field Artillery Autonomous Resupply. We love acronyms. We call it FAR. Um, FAR was was a project that wanted to improve the process of delivering artillery ammunition from a you know a supply spot to the actual cannons out in the field. Um, what the client had in mind initially was like an autonomous robot that could, you know, shuttle shells back and forth. So we, we brought in six companies to participate in this. And we took these companies out to see a live fire demo. And anybody who's done live demos knows that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And it's, it's no different for the army. So what happened here is that it, it's raining, the wrong ammunition shows up, a, a lot of things happen. And the company is looking at this, they realize that while the Army wanted a, an autonomous shuttle, there's all these other low-hanging fruit ideas that could drastically improve the process that we weren't even thinking about. So the outcome of this, uh, the, the companies presented um, several different ideas. Three of them were selected to, to move forward. One was an inventory management system that basically tracks ammunition across the battlefield. And it connects a lot of different systems within the Army, and it's, it's streamlined that process. Uh, the second was a, a mobile computer vision software. So, you know, an app on your phone that you can scan ammunition and it automatically records, you know, what type of am ammo, how many. Um, again, like this tech is being used in the commercial ecosystem or the commercial world, but it has drastic implications to the Army side. Um, and then lastly, you know, we were looking for some, some robot stuff here. So we did get a company building robotic arms, which is pretty awesome. Uh, really good after that, uh, that original uh, problem that we're trying to tackle of, um, you know, decreasing soldier load, helping them, helping them uh, save their bodies a little bit. So um, that's just a quick taste of, of a past project. Um, and from here, I'll turn it over to Claire to talk about some of our upcoming projects that we have. Yes, again, like you said, this is probably the stuff that most people want to hear. So we do, if that kind of programming sounds interesting to you, we do have three open solicitations that we're going to plug here. Um, I know there's a lot on this slide, so take a look, but I will point out just a couple things. Um, all three of our current uh, open solicitations are funded through SBIR. Uh, SBIR grants. So I know um, some people who have maybe worked with SBIR in the past have sort of mixed feelings about it, but we really do, as Brant uh, Brand spoke to earlier, we really do make the process as easy as possible on y'all in terms of speed, um, openness, and transparency, um, and also uh, potentially the, and also we, we help y'all think of next steps. So after you complete a phase one SIBR, we really try to have a plan in place for what to do next. If you maybe are going on to a phase two, we try to make those pathways really clear. And even if you're you're not going on to a phase two or a phase three from a phase two, um, we try to give y'all options and, and not just let your project hang in the wind. Um, so that's really our objection, or sorry, excuse me, our objective here when it comes to these projects. Um, I will also point out that the three projects here are a little smaller format than the one Brands just described with the FAR cohort. Um, each of these projects would have fewer awardees and therefore less um, strict like daily 
program. So these wouldn't be necessarily cohorts, although you still would get that same access and transparency throughout the completion of the project. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I don't want to read everything that's on the slide, but I do also want to point out that Exosense and STAR have deadlines coming up next week. So almost, I mean, yeah, like a week from today at noon Eastern. So if either of those look interesting to you, make sure you visit that link there at the top of the slide um, and, and get more information ASAP. And then the other solicitation listed right now is the LCLPD, and that one's got a deadline in about a month. So um, still not a ton of time on that one, but a little bit more than the other two. All right, so as we move into the Q&A session, um, I'll leave this slide up for a little bit. Um, of course, there are a few next steps you can take with us to stay engaged. Uh, of course, we'd love to see you apply, but if none of the projects uh, are up your alley, that's okay. We've got more coming soon, so we'll still encourage you to keep an eye um, on that landing page there under, uh, under number three. And the other thing I would suggest is following us on LinkedIn. If you're gonna do one thing to stay engaged, that's really, I think, the best thing to do. Um, it's always up to date. Our project launches are always there first. And even as a staff member, sometimes I go onto LinkedIn to find links or information about projects. So I, if you're gonna do one thing, I would highly suggest that. Um, so like I said, I'll leave this up for a moment, um, but otherwise I will pass it over to Chad and Art who have been moderating our Q&A. Are there any uh, questions you'd like to kick, kick us off with? Yeah, hey Claire. I think uh, to start off for the group, you know, there's been some specific questions, but uh, I think some that might help the group is, uh, what can I do now to make sure I'm ready to apply when my focus area is available as a topic from AAL? Yeah, that's a really great question, and I'm glad y'all asked. There are a few things you'll need to do before you're eligible to apply. Um, they're fairly straightforward. I'm gonna run through what I know about them. Um, and then Art, I think, might know a little bit more from the entrepreneur's perspective and be able to chime in. But there are really two key things that everyone will need in order to work with the government. And if you don't already have them, I'd suggest just nipping in that in the bud and, and doing them now. Um, there's two codes you'll need to register for. So one is called a CAGE code. C-A-G-E, it's an acronym, of course, um, and a DUNS code. So um, those are both free, unique identifiers. Um, the DUNS code is your Dun and Bradstreet co code. Um, you can get that in about a day or so. Uh, these things are fairly Googleable, but one thing I can do is also uh, collect some links to the DUNS code and, uh, and the CAGE code and, and send those out afterwards. So just jot that down, D-U-N-S, DUNS code. And the other thing you'll have to do, and this this involves that cage code, is you're going to have to register uh, for SAM. Uh, that's a requirement for any contractor who's working with the federal government. Uh, if you're not registered with SAM, you can't get paid. So it's an important thing to do. And as part of your SAM registration, you're going to be assigned a cage code. Um, this is a unique identifier assigned to suppliers for various defense agencies. And in our experience, it takes a little bit longer than getting a DUNS code. So if you're gonna do one today, um, I'd re recommend getting started with your SAM registration and make sure you get that CAGE code. Um, and then the third thing I'll note, it, I'll note is that it's also advisable to register with the Small Business Administration. So that's pretty quick. It just takes about 10 minutes to complete online. Um, you just need to, provide a little bit of information about your company um, and your employee identification number. Um, so those are the three things we recommend. Definitely the DUNS code and the CAGE code are, are things I'd, I'd say uh, do now, <laughs> um, just in case there are any delays. And, and uh, yeah, again, I'll turn it over to Art in case he has anything to add from the entrepreneur perspective. From the entrepreneur's perspective, it pretty much comes down to ensuring that your Paperwork is done and filed. You've got your tax ID number. You're registered with your state, um, those types of things. The questions that are going to be asked at SAM, um, as well as for DUNS, are directly relative to those questions um, with some perhaps more specific things that have to do with doing business to the government, um, such as if you're doing development offshore, if you're, um, what's your ownership look like? Um, but they're all fairly straightforward questions. If you've answered them in one place, you're probably going to have to answer them in another place too. <laughs> so keep track of your, of your answers. 
Thanks, um, Art. So again, just to drive that home, Dunn's code, cage code. <clears throat> and we'll try we'll try to put some information together on those and send them out afterward. Thank you. So a question that has um, in various forms been brought up twice. Um, people are wondering if the only place that they can find out about it is at the link or if they would be included in mailings and those types of information coming from AAL. Yeah, so we try to send out uh, email blasts for, for all of our projects. Um, we typically do um, um, narrow email blasts instead of you know sending emails to, to everybody. Um, we, we, trip, we typically try to send it to, uh, to companies that we know are in, in certain technology categories. Um, if you're not receiving any emails from us and you, you haven't over the last you know six months and you've been talking with us for a year, um, just send us a note when when we send out the survey because we, we can make sure that that uh, you're in our system correctly and we've got your email. Um, the other thing I would add is that if you registered for this event, you notice that we asked you questions like, "What's your tech, you know, technology focus area? What industries are you are you working on?" Um, hopefully, you didn't BS that uh, that Q and A. Like we ask that stuff for a reason, and it's really to make sure that we're we're messaging our uh, our problems to the right folks. Um, so, anyways, that, that that would be my recommendation. If you haven't been email, you haven't gotten any emails from us, just let us know in the survey, and uh, and I'll make sure that you're you're in our system. Yeah, and I think the last thing I would say, there are two other ways that announcements are made. Um, of course, like I said, LinkedIn, it's just going to kind of refer you back to the website, but that's a great way to stay in touch if you if you kind of want to opt out of the emails or, you know, things get lost in your inbox, follow us on LinkedIn. And then the second thing is that, of course, um, all of our solicitations get listed on SAM.gov, if you're familiar with SAM.gov and the SBIR portal. So if you're someone who's familiar and comfortable with those websites and would kind of rather just look for us there, you're welcome to do that. Um, I think it's much more user friendly uh, to look at AAL's website or LinkedIn. But if you're comfortable with those government websites, uh, you'll see our opportunities there as well. A question's been asked that I'm going to go ahead and take here, um, and it was asking outside of SBIR, you know, what else do we do? Um, and I want to first of all state that AAL is not solely focused on SBIR. It just so happens that at this point in time, those projects that we have released are SBIR focused. If it is an SBIR focused um, request, um, the metrics that are used in terms of the evaluation are the technology or TRL level, the team, and the commercialization potential. And that commercialization can be internal or external to DOD resources. So when you talk about commercialization, it might be additional commercialization within the military or even out on the, um, on the general market. And that, that, of course, led to another question um, that I'm going to um, actually ask somebody to take a look at that is, are we targeting a specific TRL um, for the projects? Um, if we're coming in at a phase one, what kind of TRL is being looked at? Um, Claire, can so you address that? You know what, I actually, I think I can try to, I think I can start answering that question, but we actually have our director of tech and insights on the line. Her name is Dr. Casey Purley. I think that'd be a great, great question for Casey to answer. Casey, are you still available? Hi here, hello everybody. It is nice to virtually meet you. Um, so, specific range of TRLs and specific time frames. So for the projects that are out on the street right now, uh, the timelines are listed in the projects. Uh, sometimes that could be three months for an early proof of concept. Sometimes that could be a longer prototyping development effort. In addition, uh, for the ExoSense project in particular, we're interested in technology across a range of maturity levels. That's why we're simultaneously leveraging phase one, and phase two awards simultaneously, uh, because we wanna see that broad TRL spectrum. 
So I recognize that that's a bit of an unsatisfying answer, right? Because you're probably looking for, I want TRL4, or I want TRL3. Um, and I'm not, I can't give that to you. But I can say we are interested in a broad range of TRL levels and a broad range of maturation timeframes. Casey, are the TRL levels listed in the solicitations or is, is that sort of inferred? That's a great question. So a lot of times you'll see in the solicitation that the goal at the end of the phase two, which is really the prototyping stage, is what's known as a TRL six. And in non-Army speak, that's essentially, we'd like to see your technology demonstrated in a relevant environment. So not just, you know, sitting on your kitchen counter or sitting in a lab where conditions are nice and neat and temperature controlled and there's no bugs and no sand, right? Um, but what we're looking for as a starting point for phase one or an ending point for phase one, um, that's a little bit more fluid, really depending on the project. Thanks, Casey. Another question that's been brought up, um, brought to light that term that we all hear, the valley of death, um, which is for those who aren't aware, um, in DOD, that's a gap in time between good ideas and funding, um, where companies are usually trying to survive through that process. So as AAL, we are providing access end-to-end -end with users and transition. Um, the question actually comes up, does AAL um, work with the project solicitation participants to help align AAL initiatives to funding within the Army? I, I would I would actually flip that. Before we even go, before we even announce something on the street of a problem that we're working on, we've lined that up. So, so we're working with the, our funding partners before you even hear from us on a project because we want to make sure that's in place. That's not going to mean that, you know, 100% of our projects are going to are, are going to transition. Um, obviously that, you know, from a proof of technology perspective, it, it may or may not work. But we really want to minimize the just f like, uh, you know, fumble, right? We really want to minimize that effect of like, here's a technology that is proven. Um, there is a need, but we just our budget timelines weren't lined up right, or we didn't have the right stakeholder involved. And and now they're caught off guard. So that's all what we're trying to minimize from the get-go. And that's kind of part of that process that, that Claire and I were mentioning. It's fairly established. Um, and a lot of work goes into these, these projects before you even hear about it. So like, you know, we're, we're busting our butts on the, on the front end so that, you know, as you guys are busting your butts on, you know, on, on, on the back end, like everything that, that could be taken care of is, um, and we're trying to minimize the, the headaches for you, for you all. Yeah, I want to just drive that home with the point Brant's made about transparency. Um, it, it's true that the, the stakeholders, the Army stakeholders, are involved from day one. So they've been working with our with our AAL project managers, um, usually for months, if not years, on lining up the timing for these projects. And they're they're involved literally from day one day zero and they help with the, you'll see them on the webinars. If there's a webinar for the project, they sit on the down select committee, if not own the entire down select process. And they're gonna be there monitoring progress throughout. And it's not just um, kind of an in out thing. They're gonna give you feedback, advice, and, and kind of be there for you to help make sure that, you know, the project is successful or has the best chance of being successful as possible. So, um, Brands, thank you. And I just wanted to drive that point home of like access and transparency. That's that's really what we're what we're trying to get after and, and how we see AAL as like a different sort of program for the DOD. It's one of our differentiators, or at least we, we like to think that. <laughs> a question. Go, go ahead, Chad. OK. Uh there's one on the application, so specifically, or can you can you talk to what evaluation metrics or criteria are used on the applications? And since some funds are from SIBR, should we include dual use phase and commercialization strategies? Um, I can, again, I can kind of start answering this question. Casey, listen in and, and let me know if I uh, if I need to be corrected or, or if you have anything else to add. Um, First, I want to say that the corporate ventures team, so myself, Brands, Art, and Chad, we do not make any decisions. We don't sit on that down select committee. We don't 
review the applications or the white papers. Um, that's an, kind of an army thing. Um, because we're on the front end doing market research, um, we actually are not involved in the down select committee uh, process, just uh, for transparency. And again, um, we wanna eliminate any chance of bias. So uh, we are not involved in that, which is why I say Casey, Casey might be able to speak to this uh, more, uh, more in depth. But the, uh, if you're going to apply for any of these projects that are listed, the Exosense Star LPD, um, there are specific requirements that are going to be asked of you when you're filling out that, that submission. So it, the uh, Cyber portal will kind of walk you through what is required and what is asked for. And Casey and her team have actually also developed um, like a handbook that's kind of a guide. So if, if you don't quite understand anything, we uh, we attach that guide as a as a supplemental material that you can kind of look at and and hear uh, in kind of industry speak what is expected. There is a section that asks about commercial commercialization, and within that section, you will be asked uh, to describe your commercialization strategy both within the army and within industry. Uh, AAL hopes, it's our intention that every single technology we work with has a dual use application. So in other words, it's um, you're able to use it and sell it within the army, but you're also able to maybe like make a slight tweak and sell it and use it within industry uh, without too much additional cost or research required. That is our hope. Um, what we are realizing is that there are certain <laughs> CFTs where it's just really hard to make dual use solutions work. Um, so a lot of uh, specifically what comes to mind is AP and T solutions. Uh, that, so uh, precision timing and navigation. Uh, there's usually a quite unique use case for Army that is really, really hard to find dual use application for an industry. Um, so if if there's truly no dual use application for your tech or for your proposal, um, that's probably going to be a theme across applications for that submission. Um, so we just give you the opportunity in that commercialization session section of the proposal to explain uh, both commercialization strategies to us if you have both. If it's just a military uh, application, and like I said, unfortunately, that does happen. I think that's that's understood. Uh, Casey, uh, if you have anything to add, feel free to chime in there. I think you did a great job. You don't need me. Cool. Thanks, Casey. She taught me well. So we have a couple of questions relating to the Open BAA, where people have uh, submitted to it previously or are interested in, or they've been suggested to submit to the Open BAA um, that is currently unfunded. One of the things that I would like to point out and ask Brantz and Claire to step into is the Open BAA, while it is a place to submit Blue Sky, it's also the first place that we go when a new problem is presented to us to see if we've already been presented with a, a potential solver who can help with that. So with that, I'm just going to kick that back to Claire and Brantz. Yeah. I I'll take a quick stab here um, to, to maybe add a little bit more, more info. Um, so the, the BA process was uh, was established, I think, with the intent that we would be able to find uh, unique technologies from, from industry um, or people would, would come to us with unique technologies and we would be able to match make them with, with problems in the Army. Um, as it turns out, that's a, that's a really hard process to do. Um, and you kind of need to do that at, at scale if you're if you're going to do that uh, effectively. Um, so when we realized that, I, I think when, when the army realized that, um, we, we kind of flipped it and said instead of trying to do this matchmaking process as our our, our main mission, uh, we're going to be problem centric. And so that was you know that was an identity change that AL um, had happened over the last couple of years. Um, there are efforts across AFC to establish more of that triage and routing uh, capability to, to take in great ideas, match make them with, uh, with problems within the army. Um, but I don't wanna over promise and say that's gonna be here tomorrow. Like things take time, uh, and considerable time in the army. So uh, we understand that that's, that that's happening. Um, now, silver lining here, right? The BAA that we have is not 
your typical government application form, it shouldn't take you more than 30 minutes or, you know, if it's taking you an hour, like probably pump the brakes a little bit. Um, you might be overthinking it. A lot of this information that we're asking for on the BAA is stuff that should be pretty standard for any small business to have, you know, on their, you know, on their cheat sheet. Um, the, the perk of this is that as Art mentioned, um, you know, if you submit an idea for uh, UAVs, we might not be working on UAV technology or UAV problem right now, but that's not to say that we're not going to be over the next six months or year. So if you've given us a little bit of information, you know, the, the, the TRL level, a, a quick solution capabilities description, um, that's gonna help us quickly identify who you are, what you're capable of, and most importantly, who to contact if we have a UAV problem that we're working on. So um, I, I would say that that there is some value there. Um, we can also get some of that information through, you know, your Q and A responses uh, to to things like this webinar. Um, but if you've never talked with AL before, you've never shared that information. That's a great place to start. Is there a couple of administrative questions about the slide deck are we going to be able to post this or do you have any follow-on events like this in the, in the future um slide deck i don't know if we will be able to post this um you know just working within the government everything we do has to be you know super double triple checked approved and we actually are planning on holding this event monthly on every third Wednesday. That's our plan right now. We actually have the next date on the Eventbrite page now. Um, so what I would recommend is continuing to engage in this session. If you have more questions, um, come see us again. <laughs> Hopefully the presentation will get better too as we go. Um, what I can do, if there are common questions or slides that are uh, particularly requested right now in the in either in the Q and A here or in the feedback form, is I can try to summarize some of that information and send it out by email. That would be an easier thing for for us to do rather than uh, posting and hosting this deck somewhere. So I don't think I'm going to be able to post the deck for you at least not anytime soon. But there's ways to get you the information you need. So feel free to feel free to screenshot these screens and I'll try to work through the main ones one more time um, before the call ends here. Um, and again, request any specific information either in the Q&A now or in the feedback survey and we'll summarize that for you. Okay, and we've had a question today and some with the, uh, the registration questions about uh, folks that are, working with partner nations companies and how can they work with army application lab that's a that's a good question so ael in theory is set up to to work with non-traditional companies right and that doesn't just mean companies based within within the us so from a high level yes we want to be working with with partner nation companies in practice, there's a little bit more nuance to that, right? So the the projects that we're working on are often limited by the funding vehicle that that we're using. Um, I like an AEL to like the most scrappy sort of well-funded startup, um, but we're absolutely fighting for for dollars to to put towards these projects. Um, and so we use a lot of different tools to make that happen. So the the projects that we have active right now are all SBAR. Um, which are limited to us based companies um, i have spoken with some companies that have you know subsidiaries or, or us based divisions that's a really personal business decision that that i don't want to go into um, so there are some options there um, and what i will say is that for every project that we work on the funding it, it might be different right and so just stay in touch with us keep an eye on linkedin um, attend these sessions um, and you'll start to see, you know, if we have non severe projects uh, coming up, then we'll make sure that we let you know that that's, you know, open to, to non-U.S. companies. Hopefully that helped answer some of the, the context there. Yeah, and if you can go back to the slide where you had the cross-functional teams, because there was there have been a few questions on 
how do we know which CFT their company aligns best to? So maybe give them a chance to look at this. Uh, for example, training and education, which one would that apply to? I think it, it all depends. But Yeah. So Go this, ahead, Brian. This is a tricky question, and, and I'll, I'll be honest, as um, you know, I've been with, with AL for a year, and it, it still breaks my brain a little bit, understanding the scope of what each of these CFTs covers. Um, and the reason for that is that most of these CFTs are not, um, you know, it's not a fine point thing that they're looking at. It's a very wide reaching scope of, uh, of a modernization initiative. And that oftentimes has these tendrils that reach out into a lot of different directions. So, you know, if you look at something like future vertical lift, which is, you know, designing a, um, an FBL like system, right? That's going to have everything from like hardware and machinery to AI and machine learning and, and UI and UX technologies. So um, these products have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of scope. What I would say is that there's a lot of media and publications that talk about the DOD world. Um, start tuning into some of these or, or, you know, set up a Google Alerts that's capturing, you know, Army CFTs. Um, and start seeing, getting a feel for the scope of what all these all these groups do. Obviously, some of them are, are going to be a little bit more self-explanatory. Um, you know, network is is looking at like networks and comms and cybersecurity stuff. Um, synthetic training environment is looking at like training soldiers and, and how do we do that. Um, so some of them are a little more self-explanatory. Um, but I would just start trying to educate yourself on uh, what these folks are doing, and that'll start giving you a you know, a feel for, for where to maybe focus your, your, um, business development efforts and, you know, and outreach to these folks. We have somebody on who actually is already, um, participating in, in, in one of the upcomings. Um, they attended yesterday's low cost, low cost, low probability detection, um, seminar. And because of that, it brought up a question that they have, um, their question is they build a point on that system um, and they said it would be useful to talk to or collaborate with companies perhaps this is an opportunity to talk about um, the difference between a a, a point and a uh, cohort type of challenge they, just as we have different types of funding mechanisms we have different types of output mechanisms yeah, I, I can take a stab at this. So the the way the, the the process that Claire and I have talked about for how AEL um, approaches solving an army problem um, is we loosely break up into three different different categories, um, and we we hybridized hybridized army speak and industry speak here: um, point challenge, area challenge, and and cohorts. So um, a point challenge is, is a project that we're working on that has a very specific scope, right? Like we, we know that this is possible. We know this is the scenario that we want to use it in. Um, and we basically want to see different solutions that the companies can provide to, to get after that. Um, an area challenge kind of conversely is, is uh, something that is a little bit broader scope, right? Like we think that we, want to do this. We don't really know if it's viable. We don't really know what we're looking at, looking for. Um, and, and we don't know like what's in the realm of the possible. So I'll give you two examples that are active right now. Um, the, the simultaneous transmit and receive project is a, is a point challenge. We know that we want simultaneous transmit and receive. We want companies to figure out the best way to do this. Um, Exosense is looking at how to repurpose data from exoskeletons and how can we leverage this for better soldier insights. That's more of a realm of the possible uh, question. Um, so those, that, that's an area challenge. Um, cohorts on the other side are, are bigger problems. We need collaboration. We need a lot of different ideas. We need a lot of different pieces of a puzzle to make a, to make a full solution. Um, it's kind of in that, uh, in that in between of, of, of the two, um, just with a larger scope there. Um, hopefully that gets after the question. Art, do you have uh, additional comments you want to, you want to tag onto that? Uh, no, I, I think you did a good job of explaining this. 
Brantz, can sorry if I missed this. Did you uh, identify which uh, category the LPD problems falls within? Um, I didn't. Um, LPD, I think, would be uh, a, a point challenge, right? We know that we want low cost, low probability of detection. We don't know what specific, like, you know, algorithms or strategy for, for doing this that we're going to use, but like, it's pretty well defined. That's what we want to do. Yeah, I just double checked, and that is how we have it categorized. So, um, not sure if there's too there's going to be too much room for collaboration on that one, but it's still worth applying. Sometimes um, the down select committee, like I said, that's that is the client on the down select committee. They they might see something and get really inspired, um, or see two things and and see the see the connection. So uh, I would just say be open about that in your your solicit or excuse me your your proposal. Um, and you never know what's going to happen. So we kind of have these things batched right now into point area and cohort, but um, that those aren't you know super defined uh, barriers. Uh, we really leave it up to the stakeholder to to drive the decisions. There's another question asking, how does the process go? Um, and I'll I'll read the question as is, but then restate my interpretation of it. If we have a technology that's picked up, would we be working with AAL or do we end up getting placed within a program in our R&D center to oversee development? Um, that's the, the transition as, as I see it. Um, through the CIBR program um, or through the initial part, that is run by a project manager within AAL who is coordinating the efforts of uh, the CFTs and any of the stakeholders within the Army while it's being developed. Um, there does come a point of handover where AAL is not on the project for the next 20 years because it's a product that's been picked up by the Army. But for that initial development phase and selection phase, that is within AAL. Casey, do you have anything to add to that? I do just want to emphasize something that Art said, you know, that that handover, the goal is for that handover to be to um, a project manager within the Army. So not just the person in AAL who's helping you make it through, but a person whose actual job it is to buy technology for the Army, with the goal being, you know, fielding at scale into the Army um, as part of a program of record, which is just a fancy way of saying you're in the congressional budget for the Army. So that's obviously the ultimate end goal for us transfer it over to the side of the house where the people buy things. Chad and Art, I think you guys are probably uh, scouring, but any other yeah. questions? Yeah. I was reading one about, can, can companies, um, can old solicitations be reinstated? So if they applied to FAR and they want to reapply, or is there anything they can do when the deadline is passed? Or do they wait for another one to, to pop up that relates so, to them? Yeah, so I'll, I'll comment on this and I, I want to uh, let brands comment, comment on this as well. Um, unfortunately, if you just like miss a deadline, we can't like extend the deadline or um, like add companies late into into one of the programs. So if you miss the deadline, unfortunately, uh, it's kind of like too late for that particular opportunity. But uh, what we have seen happen already a couple times is that um, the stakeholders or related stakeholders will kind of watch what happens with the original uh, program or project and get inspired to either run a second program. Uh, like I said, if it's the same stakeholder, they might want to run a second program, um, maybe with like a slightly different twist or with maybe um, a different state, looking for a different stage of technology. So uh, in that case, uh, companies that participate in the, the first program uh, would be natural fits to apply for the, the second part of the program, but there uh, there is no bias uh, shown toward companies that may have participated in the original program. So that would be an opportunity to jump in kind of uh, to a second phase of a project that just hasn't been announced quite yet. Um, and in the second scenario, like I said, sometimes other uh, 
CFTs or stakeholders within the same CFT will kind of watch as results are happening within within a program and say like I have a really similar project uh, or problem I want I want to do the same thing for for my my problem so we do see that happening where similar themes either get repeated um, like I said with a slight twist or um, a new stakeholder will come in um, and want similar technologies to solve uh, maybe a their their version of that same problem so that is a possibility. Um, Brand, so do you have anything to add? Uh, you 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 crushed that answer. That was exactly what I was going to say. We see cool. a lot of problems, but getting more problems, but getting more problems. So a lot of you know repeat repeat customers on the on the Army client side, um, and in that to you equals trends and themes in in the the topics that we're working in. Okay, I'd like to offer up a, another question, and this might be a great one to also include Dr. Perley in. Um, we did state earlier that in one of the previous programs um, that we were able to notify people of their selection within seven days. Um, this person asked the specific question, did we say that if we apply for one of these programs, ExoSense, um, we will find out within seven days so uh, yeah I'll, oh I'll go ahead Brian. um I, we don't want to we're, we're not gonna legally bind ourselves to, to to those timelines but that's what we're shooting for that's i think the gold standard that we were we showed that we were able to accomplish um there's a lot of factors that that come into play there um while we're not gonna like promise you that you're gonna be notified in seven days like that's that's what we're shooting for yeah, and I'll I'll add that uh, that statistic is seven days after the close of the application. So not necessarily seven days within a company applying, but after the deadline passed, seven days is what we were able to do for that that previous program. Um, and then the other piece I'll just add is a lot of it is very dependent on how many applications we get. So um, if we get twenty to thirty applications, uh, it might be a little easier for us to turn them around. If we get hundreds of applications, it might take a little bit more time. So um, that's what I think Brant is referring to when he says there's lots of factors. Uh, we need to set up meetings with the whole down select committee. If you know if we can't get through all of the applications in an afternoon, we got to set up a second meeting. Like you know how these things go. So uh, can't make any guarantees, but those are some of the factors kind of at play. I think we have time for at least one or two more questions, right? Okay. If you've Here's got one it. That has come up a, a, a couple different ways, but if a focus area is identified as a good fit for our technology, is it appropriate or effective to contact AAL to identify the cross functional team in the points of contacts to start conversations, whether or not there's a solicitation underway? Uh, I can take that one. Um, that's a really good question. And I think um, when AAL first launched a couple years ago, that was part of our goal was to kind of be a, uh, I mean, call center, hopefully a, a fancy call center, but be a resource for, for companies to come and say like, hey, I've got a great solution in XYZ area. Like, can I get connected to that CFT? Um, what we found in practice is that, uh, you know, to be honest, like the Army and the CFTs are, weren't quite ready for that. Uh, we tried making some of those introductions and they just weren't really fruitful on either end. Um, the CFTs, uh, unless it just happened, the solution happened to align with a problem that they had and that they had funding for that problem. Um, it was it was really rare that they that the CFTs like knew what to do. <laughs> with the company call or even really how to talk to companies right like these folks that have been in the army for for their whole careers uh it's a really a kind of a culture a cultural mismatch between what they're used to dealing with and and speaking to a startup and understanding kind of y'all's motivations and incentives and what might be an interesting conversation to you <laughs> versus them um and then likewise we were hearing back from companies uh, repl uh reporting that those conversations weren't very fruitful so um that's actually not something we focus on uh, right now uh making those introductions across afc i think that uh afc as a broader whole again that's our sort of parent organization it's the command that aal falls within they've got some initiatives in the works 
um, leveraging possibly AAL or their small business unit um, to make that a more scalable, uh, usable, user-friendly process for both companies and for the CFTs. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. So stay tuned for future announcements on, on how to get better connected directly to the CFTs, uh, but we're not there quite yet. Claire, the only thing I would add add to that as well is if you see a solicitation um, that's, you know, as an example, an SBIR so solicitation that you do exactly that, but you're not eligible because of that funding, um, do reach out to us in, in that case. It's always good for, uh, for us to let our client know like, hey, here's what is in the realm of possible with the funding um, vehicle that you have. And then here's all this other stuff that it doesn't fit within the, the funding vehicle, but we just want to make sure you're aware of, um, you know, that obviously this stuff doesn't impact the, the decision committee. It's, it's completely separate, but it's really good situational awareness for them just to know, you know, what's at play in the ecosystem and, and can this be solved by small businesses or are large companies or, you know, Israeli cybersecurity companies is, you know, which of these groups has, has what technology. Okay, folks, um, that's going to take up our time today. Um, I do want to thank everyone for submitting uh, really great and thoughtful questions. Unfortunately, we were unable to get to all of them. Um, I do want to say we will endeavor to respond to the questions that you have provided over the course of the next day or so. So it doesn't mean that we're not going to answer it. It means that we just didn't have time today. Thank you all for coming. Brant and Claire, I'll just hand it over to you. Yeah, I just wanted to give a big thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing the relationship, uh, whether it's through an application or through you attending another webinar. Um, I will leave these sort of next steps up here for a few moments uh, while everyone exits, but we hope to hear from you more in the future. Thank you.